Fingering her in Essex is a beautiful, quiet, typical British village. Just a hop, skip and a jump away from the home of Joan Hickson, who played the Agatha Christie fictional character, Miss Marple, in the TV series. The village was to hold a mystery of its own, worthy of a Christie who done it in itself. On Whalebone Corner stood the village church and the local inn called the Whalebone, and in between them stood a small, three-bedroomed cottage. Ada Constance Kent, or Connie to her friends, had moved to the cottage in the 1930s when she retired from a successful career as an actress on both stage and film. It's thought she chose Fingringhoe as she had been born there in 1871 and had, at the time, family connections in the area. Connie, a spinster, having never married, was rather reclusive. She hardly ever left her home except for an occasional visit to the pub for a quiet drink or to get her favourite cigarettes. She, it would seem, had turned her back on society, preferring solitude in her mature years. Apparently she wasn't the friendliest of people and preferred to keep the villagers at arm's length, but she did have friends she kept in contact with, and apparently some family, but it was rare she entertained at home. In 1939 something happened that would be the beginning of a mystery that would continue to mystify people for many years. It was later in the year 1939, and just a few months away from the beginning of World War II, when a friend who lived a few cottages away from Connie's became concerned about her when he hadn't seen or heard from her for some time. In fact, it would be months since Connie was last seen by the landlord of the local pub, Alfred Hassler, who Connie had apparently become friendly with. He recalled seeing her when she popped into the pub on March the 6th. The neighbour, Mr Reuben Winkle, who was also the local odd job man, decided to contact one of Connie's friends he knew of, a Mrs Maskell, to ask if she might know where Connie was. A worried Mrs Maskell arrived in the village and both her and Mr Winkle went to the cottage. After knocking at the door and looking through the windows, they saw nothing. The local policeman, Bernard Constable, was asked to investigate. He and Mr Winkle looked over the cottage, noting what they saw. The place looked undisturbed apart from accumulated dust. Nothing seemed out of place. Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet lay on the table, waiting to be picked up and read. Half-eaten food had been left on a tray. They searched the whole of the property and nothing seemed to have been taken. Her expensive paintings hung on the walls and her jewels hadn't been disturbed. Her coat was still hanging in the same place it always was and there was no sign of any wrongdoing at all. Mr Winkle stated the place looked like she'd just got up and left. It was puzzling but no one seemed too worried. Now. Connie was known for disappearing for sometimes long periods at a time. No one in the village knew where she had gone or why she went. Villagers speculated she may have been working on some acting project and maybe she went to entertain the troops and possibly moved home. But they didn't really know. So her absence in the village really wasn't seen as unusual for them. Three years later, Connie's friend decided to visit the cottage in Ferringhoe to see if it could maybe find something to help them discover where Connie had gone. After a full search of the property, he hadn't found anything. So with nothing for them to go on, the cottage stood empty for years, looking more and more like an abandoned home. This attracted the local children who were curious to see inside. They were caught on a few occasions playing in the cottage, but they didn't see anything and certainly not a skeleton. Constant Kent's absence from the village wouldn't become a mystery until 10 years after she was last seen by the pub landlord. 
In March 1949, ten years after Connie had just plain up and vanished, Connie's bank became suspicious after large sums of money had been paid into her account. The bank thought this unusual, especially when the last payment went in. In September of 1948, they had been trying unsuccessfully to contact Connie. As a last-ditch attempt in 1949, they contacted the police. After ten years, the cottage was a shambles. It looked every bit of the abandoned place it was. The walls were damp and the rooms filled with dirt and dust. The police entered the property, not expecting to find anything. It looked as it did before, nothing had been touched, it looked exactly the same way it had been left years before. The jewellery was still there and all her personal belongings, but on closer inspection it was discovered the only item that was missing was the book. They searched all the rooms, eventually entering the bedroom, where, to their surprise, on the floor next to her bed lay a fully clothed skeleton. Just to add to the mystery, next to the body lay an empty bottle of poison. Was this Constance Kent? The news quickly heard of this remarkable story and descended on the village. Reporters spent hours sitting in the Whalebone Inn, drinking and listening to the locals telling their stories. The news spread all over the country, eventually finding its way overseas. News of the Fingering Home Mystery was front-page news in Australia, America and Europe. People were glued to the newspaper, eager to find out what had happened to the mysterious Constance Kent. Meanwhile, back in good old Blighty, the newly discovered skeletal remains were taken in for tests, and at the inquest the results were given to a packed courthouse, as quoted from newspaper reports. The mystery surrounding Tumble Down Church Cottage at Whalebone Corner, Fingringho, was only half solved at yesterday's inquest in the crowded courthouse at Witham. Mr Joseph Glover, foreman of the jury, told the deputy coroner of the North East Essex, Mr F. E. M. Puxon, that while he and his colleagues agreed that the yellowed bones lying on the clerk's table in the court were those of former actress Ada Constant Kent, aged 69, they could not say where or when death took place. The cause of death is unknown, he added. Expert medical evidence was given by Dr Francis E. Camps, county pathologist, who demonstrated the similarity between what he and his colleagues had discovered from the remains and the description given of the lonely Miss Kent. He said there was no evidence of injury to the major bones, neither was there any sign of strangulation or poisoning. The found remains were buried at Cockersall in July 1949, but in the records where a date of death would be placed was the unusual statement reported found 22nd of March 1949, aged about 77. At a later date, it was stated by Scotland Yard Forensics report that the skeleton is unlikely that of Ada Constant Kent, as it was deemed to be too large and was probably that of a man. If that is true, where and what happened to Connie? There have been many thoughts and theories on this subject, but just as strange is the fact she doesn't seem to appear in any census since 1841 to her reappearance in 1949 when she, or whoever it was, was buried. Maybe she'd gone by a stage name, Vera Vachel, but even that name wasn't found. It's thought she may have changed her name for work reasons because a female villain with the same name as her was in all the papers. It's widely believed she may have moved abroad, but she still couldn't be found. It was also believed that Connie was more of a seamstress than an actress, which is possible. Her mother, it was discovered, was a seamstress, and Connie did have many fine clothes and materials in her home. 
But how did her body suddenly turn up in her cottage when it had been searched on a number of occasions? And where did the book go? As for the money, well, nobody seems to know anything about it, and if they do, they certainly wasn't going to tell anyone. Neighbours would go on to tell of some peculiar mail Connie received on a regular basis. The envelope was crested, meaning it held some sort of monetary payment, and whenever she received it she would travel into town for the day, and sometimes longer. Why? We don't know. Who inherited? Well, we do know Connie had extended family, and someone did pay for the funeral. Just a little side note. The handyman, Reuben Winkle, it's been said, was often seen wandering around the cottage long after Connie had vanished, and after some time he unalived himself, close to the grounds of the now demolished cottage. Was he involved? Who knows? There are so many unanswered questions, and I believe someone knew the answers, but chose not to reveal them for reasons known only to them. The case remains unsolved, as Connie Kent was never found.